whilst look at our, uh, our sponsors, who uh, we're very thankful for, for <coughs> making this uh, conference happen. Guys, um, as I mentioned before, there's, a, there's a, a Trello board where you can share stuff, there's a session feedback uh, site where you can um, give feedback on people's sessions, which is much appreciated as a speaker. Um, yeah, awesome event, lots of sponsors, all good, good solid companies. Alright, so thank you for coming everyone, um, and thank you to coming, for coming to a talk with the word heuristics in. That's a bit of, a, bit of an odd word, um, I'll come on to that. Um, right, what's the most important agile practice? It's like breathing. You have to do it. It's not a choice. If you want to do effective product development, uh, not just agile product development, product development, you need to be a slice. Okay, it's an absolutely fundamental practice. Even if you don't know that you're doing it, you're doing it. So slicing is the most important practice. Okay. What? Well, what is that for a start? I don't say it's an apple. What is? What is that? <laughs> the Rubik's cube. cube. Who had one of those when they were? Yeah, yeah. Can anyone complete it? A oh, whole time? Um, three minutes. So you just follow the algorithms. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I did so. I learned. I learned off YouTube how to how to do it. Yeah. Pretty cool. Why have I put that picture up? What what am I? What is? What's the analogy going on there? <laughs> Don't just say slicing. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> So what's what's the what's the difference going on here with these two things? goodness. I'm getting apple value, apple value from a slice of apple. I don't need an apple. If I want to eat apple, you can just give me a slice of apple and I've got, I'm eating apple. Okay? So, and this is kind of what, this, I guess this thought process is what we actually need to use in product development. So, slice, if we think about slicing as cutting something into slices of a chosen size, by the way, which is a side note, uh, each of which independently provides the essence of the thing being cut. So I only need one slice of apple to provide me with apple. Okay, I don't need more than one slice. Uh, so a slice of cake, a slice of apple, a slice of pizza, or a software feature which allows me to accomplish something is valuable. Uh, which, which is distinct from decomposition. Okay, so decomposition is when we break something down into smaller pieces to make it more manageable. Uh, but none of those pieces can serve the purpose of the thing being broken. And all or most of the pieces are required to build it or rebuild it. In fact, you need a knit to start with, which is another sort of side note about this. Is that you need to say, I'm building a Rubik's Cube. Um, 
A fuel filter from a car on its own is of much use. A broken piece of, of a glass mirror. Or a software component which doesn't actually enable me to do anything. Okay, so, this, so we, we get the difference between slicing and decomposition, right? So how does this relate to product development? Well, for us to get quicker to market, and we'll talk a bit more about what we mean by that as well, if we've got 50 things we think we need to do, we need to turn those into, into 10 things that we need to do in order to deliver something value, valuable or, use, or useful. It's no good just saying, well, we've got 50 things to do, let's turn it into 30 things, but we still have those other 20 things we needed to do, so it's kind of pointless. So we've actually got to rethink how we describe what those things are. And this is what slicing is about. We need those 10 things to, to deliver something useful and valuable and the essence of what we thought the 50 things would give us. So just like the slice of apple gives us the essence of apple, we need the things that we deliver to give us the essence of the, the broader objective of what we're trying to achieve. Okay, so this is what slicing is about. So slicing is about creating options. So at any level of slicing that we do, we're basically creating options independent options of, of ways that we can achieve the essence of that thing. So, and remember in product development, we're not just, we're not just developing features or develop, developing building widgets, we actually need to be problem solving, right? So we, we've heard a lot today, you know, Mick this morning was talking about, um, you know, identifying segments of, of, of your customer base or potential customers and trying things out with them, slicing your problem space. So we're problem solving, we're do, we've got to do research, analysis, design, learning, responding quickly to new information. So this is about generating options on a constant basis. This is what slicing is. Because options are awesome because they can be prioritised, deferred and rejected. Broken down pieces can't. If I break down a piece of work into 50 things I've got to do, I can't prioritise, defer or reject those. I've just got to do all 50 things. So we've got to rethink how we describe what we're doing. Um, so. We've sliced 50 options, but now we want to we, we create some focus on what we need to do. So in this case, we'll pick 10. Simplest, quickest path to value, which is the, the essence of slicing. And then we can defer, defer or reject some of the other options. And then because we're working iteratively, some, you know, these ones that we're deferring are still in our landscape of options that we can do next or later. OK, so this is a... This is, this is what slicing is about. And slicing heuristics, or this approach that I've sort of came up with a few years ago, is a, I suppose, a more uh, like a collaborative, holistic technique for describing and narrowing the scope of work up and down the value chain. So not just teams building software components or software features. I'm talking about all the way up, up, up the value chain uh, with the intent of improving speed to market and predictability. <laughs> Okay, so these are the things that businesses care about, is they want to get, they want to deliver thing, the right things, so they want to deliver those things quickly, um, and they also want to have some sense of predictability. They want to understand when things are going to happen and the scale of things, okay? So before we start freaking out about predictability, what I don't mean by predictability is we know exactly what we're going to do and when. Um, more, more in the style of a, um, of a tube train or the Shinkansen bullet train where we actually know how often we release useful stuff to customers because we do it often. <coughs> so we're actually really predictable in delivery because we're just doing it all the time. Just like a, a bullet train comes along every two or three minutes, I don't need to know when the next train is, okay? It just comes. So that's really predictable. So we have a predictable delivery cycle. Um, but we also need to sort of understand the scale of the endeavours that we're undertaking. Uh, in terms of budget, time windows, you know, market, market window opportunities, you know, the objective we need to, we're aiming for and, and the outcome we're trying to achieve. So again, this doesn't, when I say the scale of endeavours, I don't mean we need to design what we're going to build and then tell, say how long it's going to take. But we need to understand you know, what kind of time frame are we going to invest time and energy into this endeavour. Um, this is what businesses want to know. Speed. So when I say speed to market, I'm using that as a bit of a catch-all term, uh, because obviously we're not all, always building stuff that we're releasing to market, right? But when we say speed, you know, again, referring back to Mick's talk this morning, speed of learning 
through delivering something, something, building confidence in what we are trying to do. Okay, so we have a belief in, 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 in a product that we're looking to build and we, and we strongly believe that it's going to be successful in the market. But until we've actually delivered something that is delivering the essence of what we're trying to achieve and then getting feedback from that, we, we, we don't actually have, we can't have full confidence in what we're doing. And of course, confidence translates into money and investment in time and money. So we need to have confidence in the stuff we're building. So we need speed of learning, we need speed of feedback from real human beings. And that's either through conversations with human beings uh, and through observations. So observations could be, you know, looking at analytics that tell us how much, um, how, how many people are using a, a feature, for example, uh, or how they're using our product. Okay, so it's not just it's not just direct feedback; it's it's observational feedback as well. So whether we're delivering something internally to, you know, stakeholders in our company, or whether we're delivering something to market to real customers. We need to have this speed of, of, of learning and feedback. And this is what slicing, the only way to do that is through slicing. Because we've got to be able to narrow our scope, and narrow our focus in a way that's going to enable us to deliver something useful, not just deliver, you know, 20% of something bigger. Um, so the good news is, I suppose, that it's becoming more common nowadays for companies to sort of understand this and to actually associate uh, the work we're doing with the sort of value chain. So we, you know, we typically are now, you know, in organisations that are sort of, you know, trying to embrace agile in some kind of way, they're sort of using things like initiatives, and and then they, and you know, they have levels of, of work which represent kind of the scale of the work. So like, you know, you might have uh, capabilities or features or epics, uh, things like that, which kind of give us a, an indication. You know, if, if we say we're working on an epic, it's like a big thing that relates to some business outcome and then the things that we do underneath that are relating to that epic. So it gives us a bit of a chain of value, which is, which is a good start. But what's actually happening out in the wild is that the slicing that's going on, if at all, is happening just down at the team level or the, more accurately, the implementation <coughs> level. Okay? Uh, not higher up the chain where we're, where we're talking about customer capabilities and problems. Um, now, if we want to get the benefits of slicing, we need to be doing it all the way up the chain because otherwise it's not really proper slicing. Um, so what sort of happens is that we end up with this. Um, uh, and this is kind of happening everywhere, is that we're... we're we're trying to sort of embrace agile ways of thinking and working and slicing and all these great things, but we're sort of we're sort of failing from the start because we're still kicking off big endeavours, big projects, and not actually giving teams the flexibility to actually be able to truly slice options and then and reprioritise, defer, etc., etc. All those good stuff that we wanted to do. Um, and so what we end up is this kind of concept. Of, you know, we talk a lot about flow. Okay, so like a lot of the sort of Kanban techniques come through into teams. You know, you know, the concept of flow is a good thing. We want a flow of value coming through. But, what, but what's actually happening is it's kind of local flow, right, where you've got, like, agile teams uh, who are trying their best to improve their flow, improve their speed of delivery. Um, but unfortunately, they lack that optionality and opportunity to change direction. They're just they're still really given 50 things they've got to deliver. And they're trying to have retrospectives and sort of look at cycle time charts and all kinds of stuff. And sort of, um, you know, there's no real business impact in that. We're not really able to get to market faster. We're not able to learn faster. All that kind of stuff. So it's not, we're not really getting that, that benefit. Um, so, so like I mentioned, the approach that, you know, I like to take is where we look at slicing right up the chain, right across the from the problem space down to the down to the solution space, down to the daily tasks that we do space. But for me, there are three broad levels of slicing. Um, and again, I mentioned implementation and, and solution. Again, so, you know, some teams have got you know have got okay at that, where they can sort of break down work at the low level, um, which is helpful. But um, for me, we've got three sort of distinct levels. Um, so number one, uh, I call capability slicing. So this is where we're really thinking about the problem space. So we're thinking about what our customers are trying to achieve or what our potential customers are trying to achieve in their life. Not with our product, 
just in their life. Um, I've actually just remembered I forgot to press this button. Oh, bugger. Oh, dear. <laughs> uh, there you go. So the first, <laughs> the first words people are going to hear from me is, oh, bugger. Okay. Um, it's going to kill me. All right. Uh, Yes, the capability. So we're thinking about what, what, the, what these human beings are trying to accomplish in their life. Right, so th with no thought about our product or any features in our product, what are the customers trying to achieve? So when we're talking about capabilities and slicing capabilities, we want to rank those by kind of value, right? In inverted commas, so impact. Uh, impact in the market or impact to our customers' lives. Um, so that's number one. and That's the first sort of level of slicing. <laughs> Then levels two and three are both part of a broader level, what I call implementation slicing. But implementation slicing breaks, breaks down into functional implementation, uh, which is the, the steps or the workflow that the customer will need to go through to achieve the capability that we're looking to give them. Okay, so this is how we, how we functionally enable the customer to do that. Um, and this time, when we're, when we're actually deciding, um, when we're ranking uh, which um, implementation steps we do first, we actually want to rank by simplest uh, first, or simplest, or in brackets, lowest schedule risk. Meaning we want to find the simplest, quickest path to giving the customer the capability that they need. Okay, so this means we have to think simple. Okay, we're not we're not going to we're not going to look to build over complicated, over sophisticated solutions to start with, because a we want to give the customer the capability as quickly as possible, and b because we don't know that our implementation is actually the, the best implementation for the customer. So let's give them the capability, and then and then let's get feedback from them, and then and then iterate over it. So simplest. So again, we're going to generate options from simplest to most sophisticated, and we're going to incrementally go through those until such time as we say, you know, that's enough. We don't need to go more sophisticated. Um, and then number three is technical implementation. So we've talked about functionally how the customer is going to achieve their, their capability. Now we've got to actually decide what are we actually going to do to make that happen. So this is the the, the, the you know, this is getting together as a, as a technical team and saying these are the things we need to do to make this thing happen. Uh, so that's the development workflow, you could call that. And again, when we're slicing on a technical level, we want to be uh, starting simplest and then, and then add, only adding complexity and sophistication if we need to and if it makes sense as we go through. So that, that is, that's it in one picture. Okay, so the Capability space, implementation space, and then you've got functional and technical. So again, like I said, most teams slash organizations are only slicing in the implementation area. They're not, they're not slicing at the capability level. Um, so here's another, another um, way of describing this. So capability, what does a customer want to be able to do in their life? Not with our product. That's, that's jumping to solution mode. That's jumping to implementation mode. What are they, what are they trying to accomplish in their life? And there's a bunch of patterns for, uh, that we can use for capability slicing. Um, we're going to talk about look for seams, uh, seams in the in the in the story or in the in the capability. And then there's things like and or and, and customer personas and types. You know, again, remember like Mick spoke earlier about targeting a, a particular customer segment. You know, starting really small, even starting with one customer. Well, again, that is slicing. Identifying a customer that you're going to start um, actually delivering a, a, a solution to, even, even if it's not, not the actual solution you're going to build, it's like a, a spreadsheet or a bit of paper that gives them, gives them what they want, that is slicing. That's identifying, uh, narrowing your scope, narrowing your problem space so that you can move forward confidently. Um, in the functional space, again, so this is, the, this is the customer and they go through a bunch of steps to achieve the goal, which is the capability. Um, this is a so there's a bunch of, I guess, patterns that we can use to functionally slice as well. I'm not going to go into detail on these because you can look these up and, um, uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of ways of doing this. But um, we're looking for that simplest workflow, um, simplest way of achieving the what the customer is trying to achieve. Um, and then from the technical perspective, what tasks or steps do we need to do uh, to implement that functionality? 
So um, again, there's some, there's some patterns that we can use to, to be able to do that. But it's the same principle. We're, we're identifying options. We're, we're identifying the things we need to do and options of how we can do that in, in increasing levels of sophistication so that we can, we can start simple and only layer on uh, complexity when we need to. So things like scalability is a classic, right? If we're building something and we don't know, you know, we're aiming for millions of users one day, but at the beginning, you know, we don't have any users and we, and we might not have many users for a while. There's no point building a fully fledged, you know, highly scalable performance system when we, we're still actually in the problem space and still don't know, have enough confidence in what we're building. So these, these are examples of, again, we're looking to options of what we can defer um, and keep, it, keep things simple. So, by the way, defer doesn't mean ignore, okay? So we know that, you know, our ultimate goal is that this thing is going to serve millions of people, it's going to be scalable, etc. So we're always going to be keeping that in mind, but we're looking at ways of uh, delivering faster value, but also uh, deferring what we don't need to do right now. So this is, th these, are, these are patterns for, for slicing. So here's a, here's a little uh, capability example. So um, uh, Acme Bank, um, they're a bit, uh, a bit in the dark ages and uh, they haven't yet uh, got an online banking platform. So all their, their customers still go in the branch and phone up. It's pretty cool, pretty retro. Uh, so just, I'm gonna do, just, just for two minutes, I just want you to, maybe with the person next to you, just for two in two minutes, I want you to come up with a hundred stories out of this. Okay? And I'm just going to give you a tip. Going back to what I said earlier about seams. Look for seams in the, in the story. Seams being uh, general terms that could be made more specific. So remember we're looking to narrow down and narrow down our focus, become more precise. So there are some seams in that, in that statement that you can slice, okay? So you've got a couple of minutes, you should, you should have about 100 stories or more. A, a, a group I did this with the other week came up with about 1,000 in 10 minutes, so. All right, just, I'm just gonna give you literally two minutes. seconds. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So you should have about 100, 100 stories by now, right? Uh, so what are the seams in the story? What are the seams? There's three seams in this statement. What are they? Customers. Bank and online. Okay, what are some uh, what are some slices through customers? Personal. Sorry, say that again. New one, new customers. Others. Business customers. International customers. Any more? Students. School children. Government. All. It's almost infinite, right? Oops. Bank. <laughs> what about what about bank? What about banking? Bank with us. Pay bills. Pay bill. Oh. <laughs> Pay bills. Yeah. Transfer, Transfer money. Transfer. Yeah. 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 
look at your balance, apply for your mortgage, apply for credit cards. I mean, it's just, right? There's loads and loads and loads, right? Uh, online, what about online? Mobile. So, so sorry, so we've got mobile. So, I, yeah, I can, we're going to enable people to bank on their mobile. Any others? API. So we're going to enable people to bank API. Is that a customer capability? Okay, but from a customer's perspective, what do I what do I what do I want to do? I want to bank on using using a web browser on my desktop, from my phone, for on my watch. Right? These are customer capabilities, right? Um, and obviously there's way more than what we've what I've got here, but each of these is a story, is a slice. Enable personal customers to pay their bills on a desktop website. Enable small business customers to request an overdraft on, their, on an iOS app. Right? So actually, one, two, three, four, what have we got? One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, thirty. There's like 150 stories there. Okay? So what we don't want to do at the start of a project is go, oh, let's write up all our, all our stories and then that's our project product backlog because we're going to end up with hundreds, thousands of stories. Okay? So what we're doing here is generating options. And remember, what we said about slicing is that every slice is independently valuable and it delivers the essence of the broader thing. Well, the essence of the broader thing is that we want to enable customers to bank with us online. If we enable small business customers to pay their bills on an Android phone, is that valuable on its own? And does it deliver the essence of the broader thing? Okay, that's a slice. If I needed to, if I needed to do five or ten of these things in order to complete something of value, then it's not a slice. It's, it's, a, it's a decomposition. Okay? And decomposition is, uh, is useful in its own right, it's just not slicing. And the problem with it, like I said, is that it doesn't give you that optionality. Um, so functional slicing, so that's capability slicing. Functional slicing, like we said, this is where, okay, we've identified a capability, let's say paying bills via our website, we now want to actually think about what, the custom, what steps the customer will need to do to pay bills on our website. And this is functional slicing. Okay, so now we're thinking about things like they've got to, well, they've got to you know, select their account and select a biller and put in the amount and all this kind of stuff. Um, and now we're going to explore options of how we can do those things with increasing sophistication. So at the beginning, for example, selecting a biller, uh, we could just um, a, a, a enable them to enter the code manually, whereas later on we might enable them to you know, have a drop-down or search based on, their imp uh, based on uh, recently used billers, etc., etc. So there's increasing sophistication that we can add uh, to, the, to the functionality. Um, Similarly, with received confirmation, we can have, let's just see it on screen, we can get emails, we can get SMSs. There's all different ways that we can layer on sophistication to the, to the functionality. So that's functional slicing. Okay, so again, it's incremental delivery, fastest, simplest way to deliver, deliver the, the essence of the capability. Um, and then technical slicing. Okay, these hamburger buns aren't random. Uh, so, this is, so there's actually a, a fantastic method uh, from go uh, a guy called uh, Godjko Adkic, God Godjko Adkic, um, G O J K O A D. Is this right? Anyone who knows Godjko? Oh, something like that. Anyway, if you if you Google hamburger method, you'll find it. Uh, for particularly useful for technical slicing, uh, but you can also actually use it for functional slicing as well because it's the same concept. You're basically identifying well, what are the steps we need to do to enable this capability, and then what are some uh, technical options of how we can do that from simplest to most most sophisticated. And then we can, you know, we want to start simplest and then only layer on complexity and sophistication when we need to. Okay, so this is t the analogy here is taking the bite of a burger. Is that you're getting a bit of everything with each bite rather than any individual slice. So. It often gets called vertical slicing, right? Is that, is that if, we, if we horizontally slice, we're just getting lettuce or cheese. We're not getting a burger. Um, like probably a better analogy would be burger sliders, right? Rather than because the problem with a burger is that it's the, the concept of a hamburger, which is a complete thing. 
right? So it's probably a better analogy would be sliders, or I like to use tapas as a, an analogy, is that rather than, or, rather than ordering a 10-course menu, I'm going to just uh, order tapas until I'm done, until I'm full. Okay, that's, that's the sort of slicing approach. Okay, so that's technical slicing. Okay, so a slicing heuristic uh, is, so I wanted to cover off just the basics of slicing. In terms of the, the heuristic, and like I said about being a collaborative, holistic uh, approach. So this is about creating an explicit evolving policy, uh, which describes A, a shared language for types of deliverables, the scale of those deliverables, and how they relate to each other. So the, or I've called that the value chain, okay? Uh, the maximum number of sliced options allowed in a single deliverable. Uh, and this, this is where we're going to uh, start leading to our predictability. Um, and success criteria to describe the desired speed to market and or level of predictability we, or we require. So the reason I call it a heuristic is not to be clever. Uh, it's because the word heuristic, uh, so this is from Wikipedia, is about, it's a technique which is uh, any approach or to problem solving or self-discovery that employs a practical method not guaranteed to be optimal, perfect, logical, or rational, uh, sounds like me, uh, but instead sufficient for reaching an immediate goal. Okay? And I, so I like the term heuristic because, you know, working in complex environments and complex things like product development, uh, methods can be a bit too rigid uh, in what we're trying to achieve, whereas heuristics uh, basically calling out, look, this isn't perfect, but let's start with something that that's kind of works, and then we keep checking back on it to see if, it, if it's doing the, doing the right thing. So this heuristic is designed to be something that you continually inspect and adapt. So it's baking that in. Um, so actually, to use the analogy of the Rubik's Cube earlier, um, a method, you know, we employed a methodology or a method to do the Rubik's Cube. It's, you know, there's a step-by-step. -step. In this situation, you do this. You do X, Y, and Z, and you can complete this part of the cube, okay? We can't do that in product development because we don't know what the, what the outcome is going to be when we've, when we've delivered that part of the product. We could get feedback that says that that's, doesn't work or that's wrong and we need to do something else. So methods and methodologies don't work that well. So heuristics are the way to go. Um, so this is the sort of, uh, I guess, step-by-step -step process of how we do slicing heuristics. So um, five steps. So we do... Define and agree the work types. So work to, by work types, I mean things like initiative, epic, feature, story. Let's get sh it doesn't need to be those, but we need to get a shared understanding in our context of what we are calling things. Okay? Because I guarantee, you know, I, I work with a lot of companies as an independent consultant, and I'll say to people, you know, and, and, they, and they use epics, for example. They say, oh, we're working on an epic. I'll say, what's an epic? And you ask 10 different people, and you'll get 10 different answers. Okay, so the first step is to get a shared understanding of what our work types actually mean. Like, what are they? Um, and then what we do is agree a slicing policy. So this is ba the whole point of this heuristic approach is to bake in slicing, which, I, as I said, is the most important agile practice. We want to bake it into the way we work. There's no point having an important practice, which, by the way, I was obviously being a bit flippant earlier and a bit silly, but obviously retrospectives, continuous improvement is like ultra, ultra important, and if we're not inspecting and adapting, then the whole, we might as well give up. But if we don't bake in retrospectives or continuous improvement into how we work, then we're not going to do it. So the question is, how do we bake it in? So th this approach actually bakes in slicing, and it bakes in inspecting and uh, deliberately inspecting and adapting as well. So we're actually going to slice our work just in time. We'll come on to that. We're going to do, do the work. We're going to measure, actually measure how long things take. We're not going to guess how long things are going to take. We're going to measure how long things are going to take. Uh, and then we're going to inspect and adapt our policies based on what happens. Okay, so it's an empirical approach. Um, so, uh, number one, so step one, define and agree work types. So here again, here, here's an example. Initi initiative, capability, feature, story. So an initiative is like a strategic theme or like uh, some kind of business outcome we're, we're trying to achieve. A capability is an enabled customer behavior, which is expected to derive the business value that we want to achieve. A feature is a product increment which delivers the capability. Uh, and, a, and story, in this case, is an explicit user capability or functionality served by a feature. Okay? So that's just an example. You can call them anything you like. Um, now, this is where it gets interesting. So agreeing a slicing policy for each work type. Um, so 
what we basically do is say, okay, for an initiative, uh, we're only going to allow a maximum of, and these are examples, by the way, a maximum of three capabilities within an initiative. Um, and we want initiatives to be kind of six-month endeavors or three-month endeavors. So we're actually going to put, a, put, put a, a, a statement on our policy to say, we want this to take this amount of time. Okay, this is how much time we are willing to invest in this, in this initiative. Um, and we want the uh, predictability or the variation of that to be, to be uh, within a sort of three-week period. Okay, so this is what we're, we're specifying as a, as a starting point for, you know, this is, this is what we want this type of work to be. Similarly, with capabilities, it's, it's lower down the chain. So we're saying, okay, well, capability slice into features. We're going to put a maximum of features on that. We're going to say the cycle time should be less than two months. Um, and we're going to have the, the, the variation should be in days, not in weeks or months at this point. Go down to feature, say we do the same thing. Maximum four stories, cycle time less than two weeks. And we do, so we do this on each level of our, of our work. Okay? Um, So obviously, the smaller the variation, the better predictability we have, because this is what predictability is. is that if things happen within, a, within a, uh, a predictable range, so if I say something's going to take a month and it takes a month and two days, that's pretty predictable, right? Whereas if it takes three months, it, that's pretty horrible, okay? Because we've got 300% uh, sort of variance. So this is, this is where that predictability, so we're looking at speed to market, which is cycle time, how long things actually take, not how long, how, long, how long we spend working on something, but how long the actual initiative, how long the feature takes to actually be delivered. Okay, so we specify these things, and then we go off and do the work, and we measure, and then we see what happens, and we expect and adapt. Okay, so, um, so in this example, online loans, uh, we're taking a slice down from you know, the, big, the big initiative of online loans, and we're saying customer can apply for a loan online, and then we build a loan application wizard, and then we slice that into acceptance tests down at the, the team level. Um, we have one card for each work, uh, for each item of work. And when I say card, by the way, it doesn't necessarily need to be specifically a physical card. It could be a virtual card, uh, but it's a, 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 a um, an artifact which represents the deliverable. Um, we have conversations with the appropriate people of the appropriate cadence. Um, so obviously at the, you know, the feature level, we're going to be having sort of, you know, fortnightly conversations about these things, whereas at the sort of initiative level, it'll be more at sort of, you know, um, at the month, you know, every couple of months or every three months. Um, we, we, uh, we slice, so we create, remember, creating options, and then we defer the sliced out options. We pick the ones we're focusing on, um, and then we organize the remaining options into appropriate work types, i.e. push them back upstream. So what I mean by that is if we've said... You know, if we, slide, if we say that um, uh, an epic needs to slice down into no more than 10 features, if we slice it and it comes out as 12 features, we don't go, oh, okay, well, that's near enough. We say, no, we're going to make this into two uh, epics, and we're now going to prioritize which epic we're going to focus on. Okay? So, we're actually, so, so what we're actually doing, so the slicing activity actually helps us narrow scope and prioritize without having to even speak to anyone at this point. We're just literally slicing out our options from a product and a strategic perspective and then only feeding that down the, down the chain when we've actually done our, done our uh, work as product managers or, um, or executives to slice out, slice out the work at the right level. Um, so we now do the work and then we measure the cycle time. So again, uh, in this instance, you know, this, uh, a team level, for example, if we're measuring how long stories take to get delivered, we can just do something like put a dot on it uh, daily stand-up. Every card that is in progress, you put another dot on it, and that, that represents the cycle time. Okay, it's how long the card is taking to get through the system. So even if that card's not actually being worked on by anyone, it's in progress, therefore the, time, the clock is ticking. Okay? It doesn't stop just because no one's working on it. So this is, this is why, why we're measuring cycle time, because we, in order to get predictability as a business, we've got to know how long things are actually taking. Um, so we're doing that all, at all the levels, and then what we're doing is inspecting and adapting. And we're saying, well, what actually happened when we did this? 
we're going to look at the actual cycle times, the average cycle times, and the standard deviation, so the, the variance of, of how long things are taking across the different work types. And we're going to look at the, 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 the statistical patterns between them and uh, does it still make sense what we've said? And then we adapt. So we're going to update the policies based on what we've learned. Um, we're going to communicate that. Okay, so this is all about communication, uh, transparency, inspection, adaption, all good things that we need to be doing in order to get predictability. Um, and what might happen? So, uh, you know, a classic example would be, okay, we want, it, we want features to be things that take a couple of weeks, but actually they're taking way longer than desired. So, we're, so the impact of that is we're being slow to market. We're being slow to deliver the things that, that create value. So, or the work could be too unpredictable in that some things take a couple of weeks, some things take 10 weeks. We're, we're all over the place. So we've got no predictability at, at, at a particular level of work type. Um, or even new work types emerge. We, we come up with new ways of defining work. Like MVP, for example, is a, is a way that people have started defining work. So we might want to add that into our lexicon um, in our work. And then what we can do is we can say, well, if, if our cycle times, our feature cycle times, for example, are higher than what we want them to be, uh, we, there's actually things we can do here. And what we can do is create hypotheses, right, and experiments. So we can actually say, okay, why do we believe that features are taking longer than, they, than the we want them to take? And it could be, we could say, well, you know what, we think it's because the definition of the feature isn't always clear enough, uh, which causes back and forth between developers and the product owner. So we're going to form a hypothesis about that, and then we, and then we say, okay, well, what are we going to do to actually fix that? And that's our experiment. And then we make that change, and then we go again and see if it has the desired impact. Okay, so it's a, like I say, it's an empirical approach to, to try and improving our speed to market and uh, predictability. And that, that defining of how long we want things to take, the purpose of that is to uh, cr um, create a constraint that enables us to think about options. Because if we say, if we say to people, we want to deliver an objective, an outcome in three in three months. Uh, in order to, in, you know, and you've got a thing like online banking, for example, okay, which has a near infinite amount of things you could do. You could spend your whole life building an online banking platform. Okay, so how do we actually uh, narrow something down into a three-month time period that we can actually deliver something useful? So a way that we can do that is to say we want to only spend three months on this. What can we achieve in three months? What is possible in the online banking space in a three-month time period? So now we start thinking about what are our options, and we start slicing, and we start thinking about all those options we went through earlier. And then we can start saying, okay, well, what we'll do is, we'll, uh, given that we've, you know, our market research has told us that what people are really clamoring for is bill payment. You know, they really want to be able to pay their bills online. They don't want to have to go into the branch and or phone up. So that's what we're going to focus on first. And we're going to, we're going to get something uh, to market, simplest, quickest thing we can get to market. And then at, at the end of that time frame, we're going to look and see, do we want to invest more in this or do we want to jump over to mortgage applications? Okay? So it gives us uh, an ability to be predictable in what we're working on and what we're delivering, looking at outcomes, and then having that optionality to move and be agile and move across to other value-adding things if, 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 if it makes more sense to do so. So, you know, this is an example of how we can kind of measure these things. Um, this, is, this would be an, an initiative board. So we're showing the initiatives that are in flight. We said that we wanted initiatives to be maximum three capabilities. So as we can see on the board, there's only three capabilities for any particular initiative. We want the maximum cycle time to be six months. We're measuring, so the, the dot in this case is representing months. So we can actually see at a glance, okay, initiative two has been in flight for five months. There's three capabilities in flight. Okay, you know, what's going on with that one? Uh, similarly, for initiative four hasn't even started yet, initiative one. And then we can drill down into, say, initiative one. And initiative one, you know, again, this could be like a, t a product team could be looking at this. They're looking at it from the capability level. They care about the particular initiative, not, the, not all of the initiatives. So they're looking at, you know, what are the, are we meeting our objectives um, in the market, et cetera, et cetera. So, because these, option, these, because these are options rather than deliverables that have to be delivered, we can choose to defer them. 
So if, for example, we've implemented something that's good enough for now that's actually had the impact, we can now defer the other things. We don't need to work on them. Okay, so that's a really, really, really important distinction. Most teams are working on, not on slices, they're working on things that have been broken down and you must deliver these things, otherwise, you know, otherwise we're going to fail the project. Slices and give us the optionality to, to actually be agile and change direction um, and move over to other value-adding activities. So in summary, to finish off, I know it's a lot of content. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in the, in the slides that, that, um, that I deliberately didn't go through. I want you to read it and, and sort of explore this topic more. The slides will be on ConfEngine and on my slide share as well. Um, but essentially, slicing is about creating options. It's about creating the essence of the thing we're, we're slicing. If you, if you slice something and the things that you have sliced are not independently valuable, if you need all of them, you haven't sliced. Okay, so that's the acid test. Uh, the heuristics is about, um, about these five steps up here. I won't go through them again. Uh, you slicing over decomposition creates options, for, which is more conducive to what we're trying to achieve. Flow and agility. Flow right the way through the value stream, not just at a team level. Team flow is useful, but isn't really useful from a business perspective. Business wants flow of value, not flow of things that a team is delivering. Um, so slicing, having, a, having a, something that creates a focus on slicing, unfortunately, we, we tend to put the emphasis on um, predictive things like estimation rituals rather than slicing, which is actually the, the, the going to um, reduce your risk because you're actually narrowing your scope. You're, narrow, you're reducing schedule risk because you're focusing on uh, becoming more precise about what you're doing. So that activity needs to be baked in to your planning activities rather than just predicting, saying, right, we've got to deliver an online banking system. Let's design it and predict how long it's going to take. Okay, this is an empirical approach. Um, that is it. Thank you very much.